Okay, welcome everybody. Um, uh, so the talk today is by Katrina, I'll introduce her in a minute, but a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you can keep your microphones muted uh, during the talk, please, um, so that uh, we don't end up with all sorts of interesting things happening in the, uh, in the background. Um, Andrea will be the uh, chief technician, so she'll be organizing the, uh, the sound files and the, uh, uh, and the slide presentation while, while Katrina talks. So poet and historian Katrina Porteous lives on the Northumberland coast and writes from a deep commitment to the ecology of place and local community. Her poetry collections from Blood Axe books include The Lost Music, The Two Countries, and poems written for a planetarium, The Edge. Her talk today, The Seize the Boss, is about the life and language of the Northumbrian cobalt fishing community in the late 20th century and its understanding of place and nature. In the talk, touching on the language of fishing practices and species corp, place names, navigation, and visualization of the seabed, to taboo words and beliefs. Katrina will argue that elements of the cobalt fishing way of life remain little changed since medieval times, and that recent developments in fishing technology reflected in its language have profoundly altered the relation between people and place. With illustrations from her poems, she will show that an intrinsic understanding of sustainability lay at the heart of the cobalt fishing way of life and explore the human cost at which this was achieved. Um, without any further ado, I shall hand over to Katrina. To Katrina, it's all yours. Thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you all for, for showing up for this. It's amazing to see so many friends from all over the world, um, some of whom I haven't spoken to for a very long time. So thank you very much for coming. Um, could we have the first slide, please, Andrea? Thank you very much. Um, this is a map of the uh, Northumberland coast. You can see Berwick up there near the top and Newcastle near the bottom. Um, and the red arrow points to the village where I live, the village of Bednall. Uh, um, as John explained, uh, I live in this village and have done um, for more than 30 years. And when I first came to live here in the um, late 1980s, and really for about 10 years, I spent thousands and thousands of hours among the fishing people in the village recording what I could of their knowledge and um, the way they spoke and what they knew and what they did. Um, not just in that village, but really from Holy Island, which is up there just south of Berwick, right down to Amble. So a stretch of coast, probably about 25 miles in length. So what this talk is going to be is a gallop through about 30 years of work. Um, and much of, much of what it's about is explored in greater depth elsewhere. So what I've done is um, I have a website and on the latest installment of the website, which is titled Fishing and Poetry, I've put some links which um, you'll be able to follow up if there, if there are areas of the talk which you would like to know a bit more about, because really all I can do in 55 minutes is kind of scramble through it all. So the, the structure of the talk will be in four parts. I'll start with some background, what kind of fishing we're talking about, a little bit about the historical origins of the language and what makes it special. Then secondly, I'll talk about how fishermen relate to place, to the geography and their empirical knowledge of the environment, and how local stories and even so-called old wives tales are important to that understanding of place. Thirdly, I'll talk about how the language of fishing inspires my poetry, um, and what this has to say about how we relate to our environment. And then fourthly, I'll be talking about the sustainability, as, as John mentioned in his introduction, the sustainability and longevity of this kind of, of, of fishing, um, how it's changed recently, um, and what we can take away from that about our own relation to place. Now, obviously, all four of these themes are completely interconnected. They're not separate things, but I'll be touching on all of this stage by stage, I hope, in the talk. Andrea, could we have the second picture, please? Well, this is Beadnell Bay. Um, I began to write about fishing um, in this area and, the fish and in the fisherman's language for three main reasons. Firstly, because the language as I heard it 
seemed very old. It had resonances of Old English, and that's, of course, the language of St Cuthbert and the Venerable Bede going back to the 6th, 7th century. So, so very, very old language. Um, the musicality of that language lent itself to poetry, and I will be saying more about that later on. Um, but mainly, I wanted to write about it because I was surrounded by it and because it seemed to me that it was something that was changing very rapidly and in danger of, in fact, of disappearing more or less altogether. Um, many reasons for this, obvious reasons such as mobility, education, the loss of local community, loss of village schools, the global culture of TV and latterly the internet. And villages were changing very rapidly and continue to do so, so that what I knew as fishing villages from my childhood were becoming holiday resorts with much less fishing in them. So I wanted really to record what I could. So I came at it from the point of view of a historian primarily, but I came at it with a poet's ear, listening to the language. People have often said to me, well, if, if the fishing is changing, if certain things are dying out, what's the point of trying to record them? It's just antiquarian value. It doesn't have very much value. But what I want to re really try and show in this talk is that the skills, the stories, the language, much more than antiquarian value, because it is about how we relate to place, to our environment. And in a sense, I think for our generation and for generations to come, that is the major story. It's about how we relate to, to our environment, to our ecology. So that's, that's what I hope you'll take away from this talk. Um, picture three, please, Andrea. This is Charlie Douglas. Um, I'll talk more in a minute about the people who inspired me, but Charlie was one of them. Um, and what I would like to do now is, in, in just a second, we'll play a little audio extract of Charlie. Um, in, in this extract, uh, it, it's very poorly recorded, I'm afraid. It, I did it 30 odd years ago. Um, Charlie's talking about things that you don't see now. So he talks about the big salmon that they used to catch close in. He talks about what the old men used to call the gibby salmon, which had a big hook on their lip. Uh, he talks about the porpoises they used to see at the harbour that chased the salmon in, which he called skildies. And he talks about killer whales, uh, which they called finners. So, Andrea, could we have audio one, please? And they got the water, it was 47 pounds, mm -hmm. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You've seen it. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't get shot at the cunning, you know, yeah. or see. Yeah. So they just shot a net out from the harbour, did they? Just for the, the, the short, well, uh, well the yards, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. just a tie. Mm -hmm. Got a seven, four, seven mm -hmm. pound, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the old way got one sixty pound. I uh, weighed sixty pound a chat head or something, but I can't remember that, you know. I feel attacked about it. Mm. The old man, he said, was, when I, I get the gibbies when the Argus come in. What he said, he did, he got the gibby salmon. What's the gibby salmon? Norwegians, the, the gib on them, you know. Oh, the little little hook on their Aye. mouth. Aye, yeah. he said, is it what you then do? You said it was good to? That's funny. And then, he went to Harbour. Uh, get away to the edge, we were shot, you know. The big porpoise, he was like jumping right in there, you know. Yes. Coming. We yes. should chase the salmon, didn't you know? Did they? Well, yeah. Yes. Are they, they're not the same thing as the finners, though, are they? No, 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 no. 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 But the big porpoise, you should chase the salmon in. Mm -hmm. Did you have a name for the porpoises? Scaries. What? Scaldies. <laughs> Scaldies, we gather. Scaldies. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you never said them, no? Mm. You never said them. No. You used to see them, the killer wheel coming in the book of Finney's back, like a, like a bird seal, you know, at least you can't finish. You seen nine or ten or a dozen gun by the slew, you know, you see the big fin come with the wood, you know. What do you tell? Yes. But you never said them, no. Skildies. So skildi from a skild is a shield. Um, a shield also related to the word for a shelter. Um, so the island, St Kilda, I think is probably related to that. Um, the fishing shield, a place of shelter, St Kilda. There, there was no saint called Kilda. Skildi. Anyway, what, 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 what was that we just heard um, about the dialect? It wasn't Geordie, was it? Um, this is coastal Northumbrian, and what it is, it's a dialect within a dialect, essentially. Um, the Northumbrian language has several dyalects to it. There's the Tyneside urban that you call Geordie, there's Pitmatic, and there's various rural dialects. 
Uh, if you want to know more about it, there is a Northumbrian Language Society and the link to it is on my website. So, so do, um, do take a look at that. But what you heard was very, very specific. Charlie talked really essentially the dialect of Beadnell. And even, even within that, you, you see there were differences between the villages. You could tell one village from another by the way people talked. And even within that, there were differences between families. And there were differences between men and women the, in the way people spoke. So um, re re really, it's a very, very specific and place related way of speaking. Um, in the last 30 years, that way of speaking has almost entirely disappeared. It's become much more regional um, so that the, the, the more urban, the Geordie dialect has kind of taken over in the way of speaking and you get, although you get more um, resolution, more granularity inland on the coast, I don't hear people speaking in that way anymore, really. Okay, could we have picture four, please, Andrea? So this is, this is a very special sort of boat. This is a boat called a Cobal. And this really defines the area of the, the country that we're, we're talking about. Um, Adrian Osler, who I think is with us today in the audience, Adrian Osler is a, a distinguished maritime historian and he has in, he's called this, this area of the coast from Berwick down to the Humber, where you find this boat, the Cobal Coast, because it's so defining of the character and the fishing and the culture of this area. Um, what can I say about it? This is an example under sail, but of course in the 20th century, they were powered by engines. And they evolved very specifically to work with place. So they have no keel, they're flat bottomed aft. So you could draw them up and launch them down on sandy beaches in, in, in havens. They didn't require a harbor. Uh, they've got a deep, what they called a forefoot um, at, at the front, uh, which gripped the water. It had what they call a gripe, which gripped the water. And that partly acted as a keel and then a deep rudder also helped to, to grip the sea. And they were built with a, by the eye, without a plan. So everyone was different. Um, nobody really knows what their origins are. Um, the language of the Cobal can give us uh, a, a clue. There are words in Dutch, Old Norse, and as you would expect in Anglo-Saxon, relating to different parts of the boats. And there are elements of boat design that come from Scandinavia, but also from Anglo relate to Anglo-Saxon boats and indeed to Celtic boats. So the, the, the boat was built of large planks around an oak, what they called a ram on the base. And some people think that that relates to, to, to very early boat design, to sort of dugout canoes that were then built up around them. So it's a very, very old boat design anyway. I think we can, we can safely say that, or it has elements of a, an old boat design. Um, so if we could have the next picture, please. Andrea, thank you. Uh, these are three of the people who inspired my so-called research. Um, that's Charlie Douglas again on the left-hand side. He and his family were very, very important to me in Beadnell. Um, the man in the centre is Billy Smales from Craster. We'll hear more about him in a bit. And then on the right-hand side, from right to left, we've got uh, members of the Armstrong family. We've got Redford Armstrong, known as Reford, his sister Kathy, who I wrote a poem about, and her husband, Arthur Armstrong. So um, that family was also really, really important. They were very, very good friends in the end. Um, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't approach this in any kind of academic or scholarly way. These people just became my friends very quickly and I just learned from them. And th that's why I say it's so-called research. It was very informal, really. Each of these people was a memory holder in the community. People came to them because they wanted to know about things and they passed on their knowledge. Um, and they really made it possible for me to be part of a community that didn't always welcome outsiders. I mean, I, I say that, they were, it wasn't that the community was unfriendly. It was just that it was so kind of, its language and its customs and its way of life was so strong that it, didn't, it wasn't easy for outsiders, I think, to be part of it always. So I was very, very lucky that I had these, these friendships that enabled me to be, to be so much part of it. Um, they were also the custodians of their own family stories. And Andrea, if we could hear audio two now, Please, here is one of them from the 1930s. You had any acting in Anne, or those, were you? When we first came to Anne, but you tell me. The father was a ladder. Oh, I forget that. 
Huh? You well, yeah. 50 years ago, yes. over 50 years. Well, I will put on the lots of cooking. I'm going to ship, we'll ship them in the meat in the ground. Two feet, you know. We're still in. Right. We have the two feet of gold, you see. Uh-huh. And uh, steam beer. Or the cannibal, the cannibal is the wind. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that they know this, sir. Uh, if I was only one, I'd come to a while. He did, huh? Oh. He, he couldn't see by the parts, you know, so look. Mm-hmm. And when we started, when we stopped that, they started to shoot. The weather just went forward, uh-huh. you know. No, he just went down like that. So when I went and another one, another one, I had to get her. So, and we couldn't get. What had I do? We just had a touch of the patch over. I can not know shoot for you. We just had them out of the heat. To get the to the bucket, to get the wet out. Yeah. That was an eye. Forget the wood eyes. Can I tell you what, Barry? Yeah, Dane. No, let's take pumps, sir. No, no, no. 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 So that was the people you heard there were the people in, in the photo at the, on the right hand side there. That was um, Kathy Armstrong and, and, and Arthur and Reeford and, and, and their brother Billy also talking about um, the, the Robert Isabella that was nearly swamped um, by water coming over a heed over, over forehead um, before the, the, the Second World War. Um, it's just an example of, of, of the kind of stories that were told and retold in the, in the community. And I will come back to that at a later point. Could we have picture six, please? These are the huts at Beadnell where the fishermen used to do their work. And uh, this was the place where I spent many, many hours really just trying to absorb a, a, a tiny corner of, 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 of their way of life, of what they knew. Um, this was about sensitivity to the environment, about empirical observation and about knowledge, skills and memories that were handed down. And I wanted to write down as much of it as I could. Uh, Could we have picture seven, please? This is on the inside of one of those huts. So I'll just say a word about what sort of fishing they they would have been doing. Um, These men had grown up in a mixed fishery with a predictable pattern of seasons. And until the Second World War, The most important of these was the long lining for whitefish, which took place in the wintertime from October to about May. And this was carried on from a cobal, like the one we saw. And it was the most lucrative part of the fishery, really. And it was very old, as we'll see later on in this talk. They had other fisheries. They did spring potting for crabs, which was very important here at Beadnell, where we have a lot of nice sand. And they had an autumn fishery for lobsters. And in the summer, they had um, salmon and trout trout netting in the bay um, from a cobal. Um, what this allowed for was a lot of flexibility because if one fishing didn't do very well, they could turn to another. So they had different parts of the year which they could they could m- sort of move around if they, if they were doing better in one and worse in another. Um, could we have picture eight, please? There was another part of the year, which was really anomalous. It was not like anything else. And that was the herring fishery, which took place in the summer. And this was essentially a 19th century phenomenon. You can see in this picture, which was taken just up the road from where I live in the village of Seahouses, that the boats are not cobals. These are bigger boats called keel boats. And these were used for the herring fishery. And this only really went on in smaller villages like mine until the First World War. But the reason it was anomalous is because it was not like the cobal fishing, which was essentially just an artisan family affair. This was a much more industrialized sort of fishery. And it was a, a precursor of things that happened later on. I think what the whole story of the herring fishery, which essentially just filled a hundred years or so, um, was, was, was a little insight into what would happen later in the whitefish industry, to which industrialization came later, really. So um, that, was, that was an important memory in the community, but it was not something that was still going on or had been still going on in the 20th century. It was something that they used to refer back to, and they used it as a kind of example of what not to do, if you like. Um, could we have picture nine now, please? Um, so this is that was a long time ago, my word. 
Um, we're talking really about small boats like the Cobal and like the one in this picture that which was taken at the trouting nets in Beadnell Bay. Um, and before we move on to say um, a little bit more, more about how fishermen relate to place, I'd just like to say a quick word about the historical origins of the language. Um, there was a, an Anglo-Saxon scholar, uh, a poet and a polymath called Bill Griffiths, Dr. Bill Griffiths at Northumbria University, who produced a book about 12 years ago called Fishing and Folk. And in this book, Bill traced the origins of a lot of fishing language. Some of it was based on my word list from the men in Beadnell and, and, and down the coast. Um, but Bill showed the antiquity of some of these fishermen's words. So he showed that how much of the language was rooted in Anglo-Saxon with words like gut for an inlet and born for a stream, and grape for a garden fork. He also showed how there was quite a lot of Old Norse in the language with words like scalp for strike, a scalp of the lug and shiel for shelter. Um, now, those of you who come from Yorkshire, John, will uh, know that in Yorkshire, many of the place names are Scandinavian um, from, from the Viking heritage, words like scurry, nab and ness. But in Northumberland, those place names tend to be more Anglo-Saxon. So whereas in Yorkshire, you get a, a headland called a nook, in, in, in Northumberland, it tends to be a snook which is the Anglo-Saxon version of the same thing, the older version of the same thing. So in Beadnell, you get Eb Snook, Eb Snook, not Nook, but Snook. Um, but Bill argued that the, the sharp demarcation between the Anglo-Saxon and the Old Norse was probably a false contrast for the Northumbrian coast, and that really there was a very continuous culture between Anglo-Saxon and, and Norse. Um, and that's why you tend to get amalgamations of Norse words and Anglo-Saxon words in the, in the dialect. So, for example, in, in Northumbrian, in, sorry, in, in Anglo-Saxon, in Northumberland, you get rocks called cars. And in Beadnell Bay, where this photograph was taken, there are some rocks just known as the cars, which is an Anglo-Saxon name. But in Yorkshire, they would be called scars. But up here in the Farne Islands, which you can more or less see out of the back window there, um, the, there's, a, there's a bunch of rocks called the scar cars. So it's an amalgamation of the Anglo-Saxon and the Old Norse. And Bill's book, I will I really recommend to you if you want to know more about the etymology of the language here. Beadnell fishermen often used words from, from Old Norse and from Anglo-Saxon in the same sentence. So they might say something like, oh, there's a drumly deer, the deer, there's a right hobble on, and there's a nowsley mech and a muckle lipper on the water. Well, lipper, is, is a, a Dutch, uh, sorry, lipper is an old Norse word. Hobble is a Dutch word and drumly is an old Northumbrian word. So, so together you've got different strata of the, the history of the language just in one sentence. Um, but much more about the etymology in Bill's research. So could we have picture 10, please? So we move on now to talk about how, how fishermen relate to place. You know, that's the, the Golden Gate hauling pots about 30 years ago, um, just off of Beadnell. And you look out there at, at the sea and it's just a flat expanse of water, isn't it? But through these pots, and more especially through the long lines that they'd fished with, the fishermen knew every inch of that seabed, more or less, because they practically touched it. The long lines had hooks on them every five feet or so. And they touched the seafloor down the generations and all the memory of that accumulated and accumulated and accumulated and they had it in their heads. So they could more or less see their own patch below the water. It's quite a small amount of ground. It's probably only about 20 miles by 10 miles, but they knew that so intimately. And of course the seafloor is like the land. It's got all the same sort of features. It's got hills and hollows, mountains and valleys, rocks, mud, pebbles, sand, forests, deserts, you know, it's, 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 it's just as various. And the men knew, of course, what lived in those places. They relied on these memories that were handed down and added to generation on generation. Um, could we have then the next pic, picture, picture 11, please? So here they are, uh, a, a different version of the same thing, um, shooting the pots from the cobble. Um, how did they, how did they manage to, to, to navigate it, if you like? How did they manage to line up 
where they were on that flat sea with what they knew was underneath. Well, they looked at the land and they used landmarks. They, used, they lined up certain features on the land, such as high buildings, bunches of trees, hills, and they learned all this and remembered it all. It, it, was, it was handed down to them. They also used, of course, a watch and compass. They would say they'd steam out 20 minutes in a certain direction and they'd know where to find their, their dams, their boys. So navigation was something which was just really there in, in their heads. And these landmarks were often very, very old ones. Um, if we could hear audio three now, please, Andrea. Uh, well, you used landmarks for where Agia was. Just lined, uh, see Hebron up with a kill, castle where Sunland Point end, where the two meet. That's where it should be. <laughs> if you. If you if you minded where you put them, I have another castle. Uh, Stag at the castle. Uh, Buckler the youth. Um, castle the Witter Tour. Castle Term Forties. Um, castle the Heron Hoosies. <laughs> castle the Point End. Makes and touching. <laughs> Uh, Langs on the Crumson. Aye, Langs on the Crumson. Uh, <laughs> so that was that was um, a fisherman um, who's now in about eighty-five, um, born just before the Second World War. John Dixon of Beadnell, remembering the landmarks that his father had passed on to him. Um, and in many ways, the, the old men's knowledge was almost as reliable as modern technology, such as echo sounders and, and, and GPS. They had this remarkable accuracy and intimacy with the sea floor. Um, if we could have picture 11, Andrea, please. That's a bonnie boat. That's uh, Reefred Armstrong again in the Rose of Sharon. Um, and if we could hear the next bit of audio, uh, this is, this is Reefred talking about how they knew the ground as well as modern aids. But now he says anyone can go with the modern technology because that superseded these la this knowledge of landmarks. So audio four, please, Andrea. So the seabed, the seabed, over the coast, you'll get fishermen that now that seabed nearly as good, not as good as what the modern aid does, but partly as good. Yes, I'm sure. Now, it's happened twice with me. It happened with that fella, it happened with our youngest son. Mm -hmm. The youngest son, he went to the summer fishing in three weeks. And uh, I told him to get anybody, because he's got the modern year and everything. Yes. He says to me, where's the cash flow? Right. I says, you know where the cash flow is? He's asking me. Yeah, he says, I've been there now the day. He says, I'm in here. Yes. Well, I says, give him a tell her. Well, I says, keep down two more, sir. And when the two marks was coming in, we were putting the echo meter on, you see? And he uh, was in the echo meter, and we were going along, nothing, 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 see? And I was in the head where it's about 33 foot of foot, that length of foot, see? And when the mark came on, I said, it's too near, it's too near, it's not in there, it's not in there. And we're arguing, you yes. see, it's not in there. Yes. And then the finish, he says, hi, it's there. Yeah. When I tell them it was there, it was underneath me. Yes. And when he cooked the way I was, it was there. Yeah, that's amazing. That's echo. Yes. It's that good that the fisherman was. Yeah. And the, the fishing grounds was the same. Yes. Now, you come with the hills and the far echo to what I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, do, I, hope, I hope you could hear that, but uh, Reford was saying um, they had an echo meter aboard the boat. Um, but when, he, when the, the marks came on for where he was at the tiller, the, the echo meter hadn't marked it. The echo sounder hadn't yet marked what they were looking for, the, the wreck that they were looking for, because the boat, of course, was about 30 foot long. So it took a little while before in the in the, the bows of the boat, the echo sounder was marking what he had first marked when he was in the stern of the boat. So I, I, I don't know if you got that, but uh, that's that, that was the story anyway. Um, so can we have picture 12, please? So most of this was, simply in the imaginations, in the minds of the fishermen. But very occasionally, I could persuade one or two people to try and write some of it down for me. Um, and one of the people who did that was Billy Smales, who you saw in, in the earlier photograph from Craster. 
Um, and Billy drew me these incredible um, maps, which are they're quite big, and these are only details from them. But I think that the, the, the maps, even these little details, can just give you a little bit of an insight into the sorts of things, the, the sorts of ways that they, they thought about the seabed, the ways that they mapped it, because this is not just about geography. It's memories of, of who caught what, where, when, what the weather was like, which way the wind was blowing, the condition of the tide, what else was being caught at that time, what was happening in the community at that time, who was getting married, who was being buried, um, other variable circumstances. And it's just an incredible sort of mixture of human life, human history, human stories, and the, the natural history, um, the geography, the whole ecology of the place, because that they didn't separate between the two. When they were trying to think of a, a point in history, they wouldn't give it a date. They would say, oh, that was the year such and such got married, or that was a time when such and such a person was born. It was, it was, it was very much um, the, the, the human and the natural were intermingled in these maps. And this is the kind of knowledge really that simply cannot be reproduced by technology. However accurate GPS might be, however perfect echo sounders are, they can't reproduce this, this human interwoven ecology of, 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 of place really. And this is, I'm afraid, what, is, what has been and is being lost as we lose this very, very intimate connection to place in, in, in fishing. Um, if we could have the next, the next picture, please, Andrew, picture 13. This is another, another section from, from this series of maps. I'm, I'm always very careful about how I use these because some of this um, knowledge, particularly this very in, inshore knowledge, this is um, right up against the coast there at Howick, down the coast from here. Um, and it's in among the rocks, very close in, it's lobster ground. And th that knowledge is still valuable. You know, this is people's lives and their way of life and, their, and, and their, the way that they make their money. So they don't want everybody to know where to find the lobsters. So um, this, is, this is a little bit more of, of, of Billy's really detailed, detailed human knowledge of, of, of place. You'll see there's a number of wrecks marked on there. In fact, there's about four just in that little small space um another another thing about the coast you know it's a very very dangerous coast this one very rocky and uh, in the sailing days shipwrecks were were endless and, and wrecks of fishing boats were endless as well um anyway the, the the point about these maps i think that i really want to get across is that they're maps not just of geography but of stories they're maps of of, of the human interpretation of place and of, of the imagining of place how people saw those places and held them in their heads and carried them around with them it's not just pointing to places under the water but it's reimagining them every time they're named and uh, identifying themselves in relation to those places so that the fishermen knew themselves through those places. Um, and, and the community knew itself through those places. You know, everybody knew what you were referring to if you were referring to something like the south end of Muckle Car Smooth. You knew what you were talking about. You knew the stories connected to that place. So it was very detailed and very intimate. Could we have picture 12, please, Andrea? So that's Billy Smales in the stern of the Cobalt there, passing Dunstanborough Castle. I think it's probably time I read a bit of poetry since I've been promising poetry. Um, I'll just read a little bit about landmarks. I can mind the time when the men would stand on the top of the bank looking out for the land. And the sooner their crack was as good as a song as they reeled off the marks they had loaned for Ceylon. For longeth and colleth to Cumley Car, for the bus of the bone to the shard and the bar. Faggot, the stiny hills, fiddler's face, the cock cross stone and on hob hard place at Harrods who's planting on Ardway's hut. The church on the black rock where you sorry, the church on the black rock where you shoot sooth for the smooth at the benty gut. To the Kundi rock and the trink and the sand to blow feather blah, by she was grand. You could listen ah neat. There were spells there, wards, the map and the key to the treasure hoard. Now give us the marks for to find them again. How I do into the churchyard and ask the hard men for it's come with the for it's come with the wind and gone with the wetter. We'll no be wanting them new. So they were they were certainly an inspiration for what I was writing. This this language which embodies this sense of place, this deep connection to place, knowing it and naming it and in granular detail. Um, 
there's lots more I could say about the nature uh, and, and the way that this encodes a, a knowledge, a really quite scientific knowledge of the way nature changes in place. You know, we heard Charlie talking earlier about the Gibbies and the Skeldies and the Finners, but he would also talk about the comings and goings of, of when certain species were common in a particular place and when they were not, when they seemed to have died away from that place. And all, all this knowledge, I think, is important scientifically because it's real empirical knowledge. So I tried also to, to write some of that down because it wasn't really being handed on anymore, even though it had been handed on to him. You know, he would talk about how in his great grandfather's day, particular species were not common and then suddenly they come on again. And, and the comings and goings of species, which has always been a, a feature of the coastal waters, you know, things are not, things don't stay the same. We think things are, you know, they're, they're just dying out now or that, you know, they've been overfished, but things have always come and gone. Species have always come and gone. And the fishermen knew Knew about that and remembered it. Um, there were particular things, particular places where they, they knew they would find strange species. You know, Charlie used to talk on the long lines about getting things he called like little Christmas trees, he said, that were four or five inches high and they found them on easy bottom, on easy ground, and they were phosphorescent. They used to light up when they, they, they came ashore onto the boat. And that was a kind of sea pen. And it's, it's not a very common thing. It's, it's rare and it's just found in special areas. And there was something else that they used to get um, just off Dunstanborough Castle, actually, where, where this picture was taken, which they referred to as coxcombs. And these were bright red and soft and fleshy. Um, and I still don't know what they are. It might be some sort of sea slug or it could even be some kind of coral, but it hasn't been seen since the line fishing ended, which was in the 1950s. So, but it's, it's just interesting to know that Charlie knew that it was there. Um, could we have picture 15, please? So this is, this is the Golden Gate at Cobol leaving the harbour at Beadnell. Um, I'm going to miss out some of the audio because we're galloping on through time. So I'm just going to read a little bit more poetry now. Um, we would, would have had a bit of audio of fishermen talking about the different uh, species that they caught in the lobster pots, in the crab pots. But instead, I'll just read you a bit of poetry that, uh, that uses some of the words. The took, the but, the bienny, the brat, the blackjack, the poodler, the muckle sea cat, the piker, the skeldy, the finner, the plasher, the paddle hush, and the feather lasher. And beasties with names that you'd never believe that claw through the weirs and get fast in the creaves. Pipers with long legs like frogs, orchards with a thousand frogs, suckers and bookies, doggers and pillins, tiered legs, keel frones, musk shells, papstones, pistols and nancies and sixpenny men. But we'll never be wanting them things again, for it's near slaver at all to hoy the rubbish away. Our shagans, the frones and the swatters, come with the wound and gone with the wetter. We'll never be wanting them new. So um, language identifies things, points to things in the natural world, but it also can help us see things. Um, Robert McFarlane has uh, pointed out that if you don't have the words for things, then it becomes very difficult to see them. Um, in, the, in the Oxford Junior Dictionary, when they got rid of words like acorn and snowdrop, how are children ever going to be able to identify those things without those words? And it was really exactly that point that I was trying to make in that poem, The Wind and the Wetter. For who can we tell of a hobble, a range, or a rowley sweel, or a little bit lipper that breaks on the beach with the flood of the tide, if we haven't the speech? So the fishermen had names for all sorts of different winds, all sorts of different weather conditions. Um, they ha had signs which they used to look out for particular weather conditions so that a, a brough around the moon was a sign of rain or what they called a weather gar, which is a little bit of a sun dog, a little bit of rainbow in the sky was a sign, particular sign of wind. Um, all kinds of different signs to do with birds. So they knew, for example, if they saw what they called little roaches on the sea, which is a kind of orc, that that would mean that the crabs were going to be close in because it foretold a hard winter because the, the little roaches came ahead of bad weather. So um, there, were, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of these sorts of signs and, and linguistic connections to nature, which I've, I, I, I tried to try to record some of them at least. And also a great armory of different skills, which are all, again, particular to their place. So that the ways of making pots differed from vi village to village being specific to the, the conditions 
require, you know, re re requiring particular things, the way particular knots were fastened, especially in relation to the long lines. The long lines differed greatly from village to village because the tides differed in different parts of the coast. So the ways of fa fastening the hook onto the snood would be different in different places. And the ways of describing this would also be different. It was very, very particular to place. Different salmon nets for different sea conditions, different tide conditions in different bays. All of this, again, was part of the fishermen's vast armory of knowledge, and all of it ex expressed in their language. Of course, the pots are now bought ready-made. They're not like these pots that were handmade. Um, and as, as a result of that, you know, no longer are natural materials used for the pots. It's all plastic and metal now. And that means that the litter of fishing is, of course, much more long lasting and pernicious than it used to be. Most of it used to be biodegradable at one time and then they started using nylon netting. And yeah, more about these changes later anyway. Could we have picture 17, please? So this is a um, picture from more than a hundred years ago of a cobalt called the Jane Douglas. And before I leave the subject of place, I just want to say a word or two more about stories. Um, and this knowledge of the seabed that was inseparable from the stories that the fishermen told. Um, we've already heard Kathy and, and, and Reeford and, and Arthur talking about the Robert Isabella, but there were so many stories about danger and, and peril and, and storms. And uh, these stories suggested themselves through connections. Um, again, it wasn't about dates ever. Um, it was about time of year. It was about particular characters and it was about place. So there was a, a, a story that's very particular to Beadnell and indeed to February. It, it took me a, a while before I actually got the date and I managed to find it in, in the, the newspaper records. But it was the 6th of February, 19, sorry, 1895, when this boat, the Jane Douglas, was fishing eight miles out at sea with four men aboard her. So very small boat, she's only 21 foot long. And she was fishing all that way out of the long lines in February under sail. And suddenly a blizzard came on and it was touch and go whether that boat would make it to the Farne Islands. It was one of the most dangerous things that happened to the Douglas family and they remembered it and they retold that story according to the place where the boat was, which was known as the Bratting Ground. Um, so that's, it, it's, it's just an example, as, as I say, of a story that, that, that brought the place to life in the imagination, this place that's out at sea, eight or nine miles out at sea, that we can only imagine, but was alive in these, this community's memory through stories such as this. Um, lots, lots and lots more I could say about stories, but uh, time is moving on. So I, I just want to say that I think even the most inconsequential stories really matter because they bound together the fabric of the village and they gave an insight into the way that people thought about things and how they lived and built up really rather like that map that you saw of Billy Smales. They built up into a sort of network of memories and beliefs that bound the, the, the community together and from which people get, got their sense of identity. So uh, the stories, even if they're quite inconsequential stories, the stories really mattered. Um, I've lost my place in my notes. Wait a second. Here we are. Before I, before I leave language altogether, I'd just like to say a little bit, or I'd like to say a little bit about how this inspired my poetry, because really it, it's, it's the expressiveness of the language, I think, that, that, that really made me feel that poetry was the best way to, to articulate the fisherman's knowledge. Um, what I mean by expressiveness is, I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example of two birds. One of these is a very light, deft, quick bird, and one of them is heavy and dark and cumbersome. And one is called a picky, and the other is called a gorma. Now, one of those is actually a tern, which is the quick bird, and the gorma is a cormorant, which is, as you know, a much more awkward and cumbersome bird. Now, which do you think is which? The picky is the quick, deft bird, and the gorma is the cumbersome bird. And you can hear that in the sound of those words, the gorma and the picky. 
I'll give you another example. Here are two sea conditions. One of them is a short surface sea and the other is a, an onshore gale with big rollers. So one of them is hobbly and the other is goerly. Hobbly and goerly. Which do you think is the, the, the heavy sea and which do you think is the light sea? You can hear it in the sound of the words. The goerly is the heavy sea and the hobbly is the quick light sea. And this is, this is a really significant thing because these ways in which language actually express the thing that, that, that it's describing is a very, very ancient, almost, almost a sort of mapping of, of, of sense, of, of sensory experience and language in the brain. It's, it's very primitive. It happens at a very basic level of the brain so that you're not just signposting something. You're not just using a word to say, this is a thing and the thing is over here. You're almost bringing the thing into the presence of the listener by using the language which evokes it, which expresses it. So picky and gorma, picky e evokes, brings the, the light turn in front of you and gorma brings the, the heavy dark bird in front of you. Do, do you understand what I mean? It's not just signposting something, it's expressing it. And this, the dialect, the fisherman's language did this time and time and time again. And this is also something that I was hoping to do in my poetry. And what, what I think is interesting about this is that it reveals a very deep connection between the natural world and language. It's language evoking the natural world. And the logical conclusion of this is that naming things is actually in some way to, to connect with the thing itself, not just signposting it, but connecting with it, so that language can actually in some way influence the environment. Now just think about that for a minute. Fishermen are traditionally very superstitious and with good reason, you know, the sea is a very dangerous place. And um, we've already heard about lots of near misses in Kobos. And indeed in the 1880s in my village alone, there were four kobolds lost and 10 men lost from them in four separate incidents. Just think about that in a village, you know, a small village of 300 people. That's an incredible loss of life. It was a very, very dangerous way of life and, and remains a dangerous way of life to this day. So fishermen are superstitious and had lots and lots of superstitions, which I have no time to go into. But one of those superstitions had to do with words and the words that you could and could not say, at sea, particularly at sea. Um, and often these words were connected to animals or connected to the natural world. So that you had the animal with the long tail that you couldn't name. And the animal, particularly with the curly tail that you couldn't name, I'm sure you all know about him. Um, there are lots of names for him. He was known as um, the Guffy, the Grunter, the Article, John Alec. Um, but you couldn't, you couldn't say his name, the animal with the curly tail. Um, there, were, there were a number of other things that you couldn't say at sea, even in some places, in some villages, not Beadnell particularly, but Craster, you couldn't say the name of the red fish. So, uh, and there was, uh, there, there was, I think, at the root of this, this, this very ancient connection between naming things and connecting with them, actually visualizing, bringing them in front of you. Um, so I think this is something that, that fishing people and poets have in common, this belief in the actual power of language in, a, in an almost sort of magical way to influence, to influence nature, these taboo words. Um, I would like to say more about it, but there's so much, there's just so much to say really. And I do want to get on to sustainability. But before I leave the expressiveness of language, just one more thing. The fisherman's speech, and you've heard several examples of it now, the fisherman's speech had a really strong rhythm to it. And again, this is something very important to a poet. Um, when I wrote the, the, the Wind and the Wetter um, many years ago now, I was very conscious of that. And of not just wanting to use the vocabulary, but of wanting actually to get the sentence sound of the fisherman's speech, the, the, the kind of rhythm of it, the metrical rhythm of it, which was again, a mnemonic device. It was a way of remembering things for them. So when they were trying to remember the landmarks, they would use these particular rhythms. And um, when they were remembering their stories, many of the sections of the stories were in this particular rhythm 
And I basically just took lots of sayings of theirs, of the fishermen's, and I, I wrote the poem around those sayings. So come with the wind and gone with the wetter. It's just one of their sayings, which meant easy come, easy go. Or how I do into the churchyard and ask the yard men, which meant, well, you know, go and dig him up if you want to know the answer for that, you know. So th those sorts of, 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 of sayings, the, the meter of them, the, 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 the sing song sound of them was very important as an inspiration for the poetry that I wrote about them. Um, so finally, in the last few minutes, just to get on to the, the antiquity and the sustainability of this way of life. Um, I'll, I'll stick with this picture for the time being. Um, it must be clear by now that all my interest in all of this is not purely antiquarian. The language and the culture that I've been talking about embodies values. And one thing that impressed me right away with all the fishermen that I, I, I knew was that they were all natural conservationists. They wanted the fish to be there for their sons and their grandsons. This is not, not a romantic argument, it's just a matter of fact. Of course they wanted to make money, of course they wanted to catch as much as they could, but they were also very well aware of what was going wrong with the fishing. They came from this tradition of long lines for fishing for whitefish. Um, now, years later, after many of my interviewees had passed away, um, Adrian Osler and I, uh, we were able to, to, to do some a piece of research um, a historical research project. And we're lucky in this part of the world to have a very unusual written record about fishing. Um, and it's a result of um, Holy Island, a few miles to the north of here, and Farn Island had a long monastic community, a long monastic tradition, which was associated with Durham Priory down the road. And Durham Priory kept written records from the 1300s. And among these written records was um, a record of the kind of fish that were being caught and the kind of gear that they were using to catch it um, in the cellar as accounts. And what Adrian and I found was that there were really striking correlations going back to the 13 and 1400s. First of all, in what was being caught then and with what was being caught in the first half of the 20th century when the long lines were still being used, with almost all the same species were being caught. There were one or two things that we weren't catching, you know, 700 years later, but they were things like seals and porpoises, which we don't eat anymore. But most of it was exactly the same. And the same was true of the gear as well. They were buying cobals. Now, we don't know what they meant by cobals, but pretty much it's the same word, so they might may have had very much in common. Um, they were buying herring nets and seine nets, lobster nets, hand lines, and most striking to me was they were buying long lines with 700 hooks on them, and 700 hooks was the number of hooks on a half line. Um, in, in Charlie's time in the early 20th century. Um, they would take 1400 hooks to sea, so two half lines. So that was really, really striking to me, that that, that continuity of tradition. Um, So this is, this is just a little insight, I think, into the kind of antiquity of this tradition. This is a splicing pin made out of a, a, an animal's vertebrae, and it was given to me by one of the Beadnell fishermen, and he had used it up until the end of the long lines in 1950 to splice the um, sneeds, the, the, the snoods that connected the hooks to the line, onto the line. So, I mean, that could have come out of the Stone Age, really. It's a very, very ancient piece of gear. And I suspect that that tradition that, we, that Adrian and I found going back to 1300 was actually in many ways much, much older than that. You know, many of the, many of the things like the netting needles that fishermen still use all around the world are very, very old tools. They might be made out of plastic now, but the basic design is thousands of years old. Um, this is not to say that there hadn't been any change. You know, we saw we saw earlier on that the, the herring industry had been industrialized essentially in the in the 19th century. But there was this palimpsest of this of traditions, one tradition laid on top of another, so that this old way, this old artisan way of fishing from a cobble. Um, was something that was mixed in with other more industrialized fishing, but which carried on right into the middle of the 20th century. 
Could we have picture 19, please, Andrea? Um, so here are here are the Beadnell women at the herring. Um, this is the the uh, the summertime occupation and the, the the more industrial occupation. But these women's lives um, it was something I really think that we would not want wish to go back to because sustainable it might have been. It carried on over all those centuries, which shows you that they were not being overfished. They were just fishing in a way that was entirely sustainable and manageable. But it was done, this happened really at a huge human cost. Um, the half lines that I've talked about of 700 hooks, each man took two of those half lines to sea. Um, and a cobalt had either three or four men in, so had at least three, maybe four miles of line and thousands and thousands of hooks, each of which had to be baited every day with a mussel and sometimes two mussels or a mussel and a limpet. Could we have the next picture, please? Andrea, thank you. This is um, New Biggin. Um, and the woman that you can see there in the foreground uh, is putting the bait onto one of these long lines because indeed this was the women's job. They had to go down the rocks to gather the bait. They had to skin it to take it out of its shells. And then they had to put it on these hooks. 1,400 hooks per day per man. And if you had more than one man in your family, if you had a husband and a son or a husband and two sons, you had to do a line for each of them. And each line took about three hours if you were really skilled at it. It was a huge amount of work. And it was described by a number of the fishermen and their wives who had talked to me about it, who had lived it as a form of slavery. The women didn't get paid for it but they had to do it. This was part of what you had to do if you married a fisherman. And if you came from outside the community, it was a hard thing to learn how to do. And um, that's why fishermen married people from within the community really, because they needed somebody to help them with the long lines. And this was the price of that sustainability. So I think this is something that we have to remember when we can't look back at the past nostalgically, but we also have a lot to learn from it because that, intimacy with place, that connectedness with, with place through story, which I've talked about is so important as, as a model for how really to fish sustainably. And, and much of that still carries on, I think, to this day. Now, I don't want to go on for too long, but perhaps we could have the last, the last picture or, or picture 22. Oh, well, yeah, we'll have this picture. Yes, that's right, picture 21. Um, Again, women, women's job was to sell the fish. And these two characters from Holy Island, this picture was taken in 1880, um, really represent, we think, Adrian and I think, the last of a, a, a medieval tradition of, 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 of what they call fish horses in the medieval account. But these, these two donkeys, cuddies, which, which were used to sell the fish around the doors, another part of the women's unpaid labor. Um, could we have picture 22, please? Um, this is, um, I, I, I hope that he's here with us in the audience, Chris Armstrong, but uh, this is what's um, replaced the cobalt, really, very sadly. Um, it's a lovely boat and it's a lovely picture, but it's sad that the cobalt is gone, I think. Um, this is um, a kind of, the kind of boat that you find all around the country now, um, a, a potting boat, very versatile, very fast, in many ways much safer than a cobalt. Um, but 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 also not as 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 connected to place, not as local, not locally built. So that's why I say it's 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 sad really that the the, the cobalt has gone and that con that strong connection to place has gone has gone with it. Um, in the past thirty years, there's been a great contraction of the number of boats and the types of fishing and fish caught and the kind of gear used. Um, but. But really, it, 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 it's that loss of connection, intimate connection to the, to the sea floor, I think, through the memory, which the long lines had kind of epitomized, that I think has really changed the fishing so much. Um, the cobalt was, was self-limiting in terms of size. It could only carry so much gear um, and it, it could only land so much fish. And what has tended to happen is that 
bigger boats, bigger boats than the one in the picture have kind of taken over in the fishing um, and, and have squeezed small boats like this out on the whole. So that the, the kind of fishing has contracted and really most of what you get now is just potting on the coast. Uh, of course, this is salmon fishing and, and salmon fishing has been uh, banned altogether. That's a whole other story. I'd love to go into that, but we have not got time for that. So, um, I've tried to talk about why it was inherently sustainable. Um, there's, so, there's so much more I'd like to say, but if we could just have, not the last picture, but the, ne the next picture after this one, and then I I'll end with that, I think. Um, this picture is of the last time that the Golden Gate was launched at Beadnell in 1995. And this picture contrasting with the one that comes before, I think kind of sums it up for me, because there was Chris Armstrong in the True Vine on his own fishing, and that's how fishing is carried on now. But this, a cobal, a cobal was a whole community. You know, you couldn't get a cobal to sea without the whole street, really. And the cobal kind of sums it up as the way that the seabed was seen and known, the way the place was known, the whole community took its identity from this woven network of stories. And the cobal sort of represents that. And the individualistic kind of fishing that has taken over from it separates, in a, in a sense, separates people from place. Of course, of course, there's still huge skill involved in it. Of course, there is. And the small boat fishing carries on. You know, it, it, it still does the least damage of any kind of fishing, really. But the sustainability, which this old tradition represents, I think, is very, is very interesting and is um, kind of embodied in its language if you like. So much more I want to say, but I've got to end there. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sure you've all got lots of questions and things you'd like to disagree with. So I'll hand over, I'll hand back over to John. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. That was, that was, that was wonderful. Well, hopefully we'll, you come back again and, and deliver uh, some more talks about the, the 